tonight on the Fifth Estate, north of Montreal. An outlaw biker is on the run, escaped from prison. He's a cold-blooded killer, an elite member of the Hells Angels. As police close in on his hideout, the biker kills himself rather than return to prison. But he leaves a bombshell, recorded evidence suggesting that for years, the Hells Angels had on their payroll this star cop, one of the most successful biker investigators in the country. He was considered one of the elite, one of the go-to guys in Quebec. I would never have thought that he would be somebody that would, would cross a line. The arrest raised so many questions. What happens to police officers who spend years working closely with biker gangs? Corrupt police persons are made, not born. How thin is that line that divides cop from criminal? The line between good and evil cuts through every human heart. Walk the line. Hi, I'm Mark Kelly and welcome to the program. We send them to do battle against organized crime. Police officers who work in the shadows, trying to get as close to hardcore criminals as possible, infiltrating biker gangs or convincing killers to become police informants. To protect us, we want them to dig deep in the dirt and then we expect them to stay clean. But for police officers, it's a fine line between trust and temptation. Tonight, you'll meet some who resisted that temptation and others who were accused, convicted and jailed for crossing the line. They're known as the one percenters, not the economic elite, but the criminal elite. Outlaw bikers. And no biker gang generates more fear and fascination than the Hells Angels. Despite their fierce reputation, their signature death head emblem, and their blatant contempt for the law, they're folk heroes to many, but not to the police who often seem powerless to stop them. They do have an element of riding and having fun, obviously, uh, which is, is their roots, but for the most part, they survive by criminal activity. The Hells Angels have a worldwide reputation to be the best killer in the world. Power and drugs and money, that's what it's all about. It was that drive for power and money back in 1994 that fueled the gang's goal of controlling the drug trade in Montreal. But standing in the way of the Angels' ambition was a rival gang called the Rock Machine. This meant war. Guy Ouellette was the top biker cop with the Quebec Provincial Police. He remembers the very day the biker war began, July 14, 1994. Starting that day, they were at war. At war means killing each other because uh, I want your territory. This turf war was as long as it was bloody. There were car bombs, fire bombs, street shootings. The corpses started piling up on the streets of Montreal with the lucrative drug trade, the poison prize. Behind the scenes, the bikers were living the high life, bankrolled by the profits of their criminal empire. The money, the women, the booze and the drugs, the bar brawls, they seemed invincible above the law. René Charlebois was one of them, living like an underworld untouchable. He rose quickly in the hell's hierarchy by proving he would kill for the gang. In 2000, he lured a fellow biker, a suspected police informant, to a remote cottage. Charlebois didn't know the source was wearing a hidden microphone. 
This is the actual recording of what happened that day. First, Charlebois demanded to know if the biker was a snitch. <laughs> then, the last sound on the tape. The informant was shot, point blank. Police found the body dumped in the snow beside a highway. It would take years for police to identify Charlebois' voice on the tape. Meanwhile, he didn't go underground, far from it. Charlebois' wedding became tabloid fodder in Quebec when he got Jeanette Renault, Quebec's answer to Anne Murray, to sing at the reception. The party was thrown by the Quebec biker king himself, Maurice Montboucher. René Charlebois had arrived. In the wedding video, Charlebois is heard pledging his life and his love to the bikers. My brothers, I love you. My heart, my blood and my life belongs to the Hells Angels. Watching it all with frustration was Guy Ouellette. Our job was to catch bad guys. Our job was to stop bombs. But do you know some people will say, you've got bad guys killing bad guys. You know, they're, they're eliminating each other. My job is to protect people. Hells Angels don't care about you or your life or anything. It's all about money and power. My concern was receiving a phone call or a pager at that time. Do we have victims? That call came in the summer of 1995. On a hot August afternoon, the biker war was about to claim its first civilian casualty. Here in the heart of a residential East End Montreal neighborhood, a biker bomb ripped apart a Jeep and it didn't just claim the life of the rock machine member behind the wheel, it also killed an 11-year-old boy, Daniel Desrochers. Hundreds of people, many who never even knew the boy, showed up at his funeral. His grieving mother's loss became their loss, and the biker war became their war. And now, more than ever, people wanted it stopped. A posse of protesters even surrounded one of the bikers' bunkers. Enough is enough, and we don't. We want them out of the of the city. Their message was blunt: Get the hell's out of here. Under growing political pressure, a special task force was created, bringing together RCMP, Quebec provincial, and Montreal police forces. And on that team would emerge one detective who would play a decisive role in bringing the high flying angels back to earth. Benoit Roberge proved to be a fearless cop right out of the police academy who graduated into a job with the Montreal police. He had a fascination for the biker underworld. He quickly built a reputation for being a bit of a cowboy cocky enough to walk right up to a biker at a funeral and give him a business card in the hopes of turning him into a source. He was, was one of the rising stars. I, I think, from what I understand, was uh, very highly looked upon within his own organization. He was one of that top level of, uh, of intel individuals who were, were gathering the information. And, you know, if, if uh, I had heard that he was promoted to... Uh, uh, a very senior rank, I wouldn't have been surprised. Bruce McDonald was an RCMP biker cop in Halifax. He says during the biker war, police were always on the lookout for gang members who would sell out their buddies. It wasn't uncommon for sources to come forward because they were disrespected by the, the bikers. And then, of course, there was the other side where so sources were developed when there were charges on them and they didn't want to go to jail. And there were also those that uh, did it for the money. 
In this 1997 interview, Robert said undercover cops couldn't infiltrate the biker gangs. That's why he says informants became a necessary evil. Uh, my belief is that Ben was um, a very good source handler, that he developed sources, and his personality would allow him to do that. Very outgoing individual, um, very smart, understood the rules. Sources like Eric Nadeau. He was a gun runner and a drug dealer for the Hells Angels. He was also leading the double life of a police informant. And he was impressed by his police handler, Benoit Roberge. A young guy, uh, he was a rookie and I was too. Super nice, uh, always very polite. He, he was my buddy, he was like my friend. I mean, we just clicked right from the start. And what did he want? There, there was no trivial information. Everything was good. Uh, whatever it was, it didn't matter. Uh, rumors, stuff that happened, an address, a license plate, a phone number. Everything was good enough to feed into the police database. By now, the Hells Angels were targeting more than rival gangs. Two prison guards were shot and killed in broad daylight the bikers would bow to no one. So Roberge did what he always did, working late into the night, meeting criminal sources in the shadows. Robert says he was handling as many as 50 informants. I won't say he hated bikers, because that's not a right, the right term to use, but he hated what they stood for. Step out here, turn around, face the other way. Back up towards not drop those His work began to pay off. Robert and his colleagues recruited sources who gave police unprecedented access to the biker underworld. Police were tipped off to when and where bikers would meet. Then they sat back and watched as the bikers dropped off hockey bags stuffed with drug money, while hidden cameras inside their offices caught the gang counting the stacks of cash. By 2001, police had seen enough. The anti-biker squad finally pounced. It was called Operation Springtime. At that time, the largest ever one-day police sweep in Canadian history. Some 2,000 police officers swooped in, rounding up bikers, weapons, and millions in cash. The evidence? Thousands of hours of police surveillance, all thanks in part to Roberge's sources. 142 bikers were arrested, among them René Charlebois, the notorious Hell's hitman, as well as the powerful leader of the Angels in Quebec, Maurice Montboucher. These arrests sealed the reputation of Benoit Roberge. His ability to find a weak link to turn biker against biker was attracting plenty of attention in Quebec, according to his former boss, François Bigras. So he had a talent, he had a gift. It's a gift. It's a talent, it's a gift, and he used it. He used it well, but he liked the highlight. He liked to be in front of the camera. That's why everybody knows Roberge. And when the biker trials began, Roberge was front and center, testifying as an expert witness. But Bigra says the attention was clearly going to his head. He, he have a big ego and you don't have to like to act like that to be a good police officer. There's no doubt the Maverick Roberts had plenty of critics on the anti-biker squad, but no one could argue with his success at making arrests. So when Roberts himself was arrested last October, the news shocked the province. How could a star cop of all people turn to the dark side? Maintenant, c'est une véritable bombe dans les domaines policiers et judiciaires. L'arrestation et les accusations de gangstérisme des mots. Robert is facing four charges, two of gangsterism as well as breach of trust and obstruction of justice. The provincial police arrested him in a sting and charged him with selling inside information to the Hells Angels. Longtime friends like former biker cop Bruce McDonald were stung by the news. What was your reaction when you heard that Benoit Robert had been arrested? I guess in your mind when you um, think of 
people that could possibly cross the line, he's not someone that I would, would think of. For the individuals that did this full time, that, that chased bikers for extended periods of time, um, there was a definitely an, an us and them. There was a, there was a, a very, not a, a fine line, there was a big line that you just didn't cross. And, and uh, I would never have thought that he would be somebody that would, would cross a line. Roberts was also shocked by the turn of events. From inside his jail cell, he wrote this letter, obtained by the Radio Canada program Enquête. I cried so much. I'm still crying while I write this letter sitting cross-legged on my bed with no bench or chair. My cell is in ruins. Once a star cop, he now said the guards are treating him like a dog. He said he feels abandoned, powerless to stop journalists from convicting him in the court of public opinion. The reaction to Roberge's arrest is more than just shock and awe. It also sparks some serious questions. The charges against him date back to 2010. So how is it that for three years, nobody raised any red flags about him? And if the charges are true, how much damage had he done? But more than anything, many wonder why would a veteran cop turn his back on his badge? Well, to understand that, you have to understand the psychology of walking the line. When we come back, the thin line that can separate a cop from a criminal, from someone who's been there. The line between good and evil cuts through every human heart. It was the summer of 1997. The Hells Angels were on the move expanding their criminal empire across the country. Rolling into Edmonton, where the police were waiting for them. It's during operations like these, where the cops and the criminals come face to face. Biker cops from Quebec were there to help keep the Angels' ambitions in check. One local Mountie, Bob Stenhouse, remembers meeting a hotshot Montreal cop that summer named Benoit Roberge. To be honest, I thought he was a little too cozy and a little too friendly with the bikers. Uh, a little too much smiley and shaking hands, kissing babies type stuff. Stenhouse worked undercover for the RCMP for more than a decade infiltrating gangs, following the drug money, which led him to the bikers. He had no love for them. I've always kind of had this you know, sense of justice, sense of right and wrong, to a degree, um, and uh, never really cared for bullies that much growing up. Did you see the bikers as bullies? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet, after years posing as a biker, he began to understand the allure of the angels. You get that false sense of power, right? You're riding around in a Harley, it's loud, you got the skull cap on, you know everyone's watching you. There's, a, there's that seduction to the power, um, the ability to tap into your dark side a little bit, that wild side, and it feeds the pride. And of course, so the more you do it, the more kind of, uh, you know, 10 foot tall, bulletproof, arrogant, prideful you get. And um, my own personal experience was being proud of the on-off switch, but as I did more and more and more, the switch became uh, a dimmer switch. Stenhouse didn't just have to look like a criminal, he had to think and act like one. When one gang member bragged about killing a man, Stenhouse, posing as a biker boss, dared the killer to prove it. So he took Stenhouse to the woods in the dead of night. This was like 11 o'clock at night. We had to find shovels and we had to find flashlights. So we were out there in the middle of nowhere and digging and digging and digging. Sure enough, we dug up the body and uh, it was probably the, the most, um, it, was, it was not pleasant, it was, it was hard. I put my hand in the grave and, and uh, touched the body and it was rotting and smell and all those types of things, right? But in the meantime, of course, you're acting the tough guy, like this is cool and you're giving him the high five, cool, you're great and all that type of stuff. But what's going on inside is lots of mixed emotion. It was here in bars on this strip in downtown Edmonton where Stenhouse spent many nights undercover with the underworld. 
Oh yeah, the smells, the sights, the sounds, lots of memories, not good. So what was your low point or what was your lowest point? Probably uh, after my separation divorce when I was on my own, uh, running undercover, I just finished up the biker investigation, was on the, the uh, emergency response team and I was drinking a lot and I was burned out. Did that make you vulnerable? Yes. I would, I would say absolutely. So I, I think that, that not only are you wrestling with, um, you know, kind of that dark side of humanity in terms of the behavior you see, in terms of the, the brokenness, the abuse, the struggle, um, but you start to wrestle with it with yourself. Um, that's where you're vulnerable. And that's where, where the smart criminal knows you're vulnerable. What do you think it was that ultimately kept you on the right side of the line? But for the grace of God go I, um, you know? Uh, you know, I, um, I got out of it um, in time. I mean, I've, I've had um, two ex-colleagues die. Um, one died of alcoholism, one died of suicide. I saw guys that had been doing it for too long, and I saw what it did to their life. I said, I don't want to go there, so I need to make some choices to go this way. <laughs> While some officers may have narrowly escaped crossing the line, for others, the temptation is too great. So what draws them to the dark side? Well, maybe it's the money and the drugs, the rock star lifestyle, the power and attention that comes from hanging out with criminals. Rapinder Sidhu, a former Mountie, spent years as an undercover biker cop in BC. He pled guilty last year to running a multi-million dollar drug smuggling ring for the Hells Angels. Dean Rudge, a veteran police officer from the Niagara region, was leaking police information to the Hells Angels for two years. His sentencing judge called it an act of treason. Tonight, an untimely death. And the Fifth Estate famously reported on another RCMP drug investigator, Claude Savoy, and his ties to a Montreal gang. On the eve of the broadcast, he committed suicide. Every cop who crossed the line has their own complex story, like Claude Aubin, once a tough street cop in Montreal. So why did you want to be a cop? When I was a kid, I, I wanted to be a sheriff. But we don't have sheriff here in, in Canada, so I, I became a cop. And I did it for 32 years, and believe me, this was one of my worst mistress. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it, and I'm not joking. I'm, make, I'm still making arrests uh, in my dreams. How would you get to know the criminals? <laughs> By arresting them. <laughs> you know, I, I made a very fast count of how many people are arrested in my career, and it's, I'm very close, probably a little more than 3,000 people. Myself, I've got a big ego, okay? Uh, uh, I know it, but in the same time, if I make a mistake, I'm going to look at you in the eyes and say, shit, I made a mistake. And he made a big one. After more than 30 years on the force, Oban retired and started his own security firm. Police busted him for selling confidential information to the Russian mob. He did two years behind bars. You know, I, there's, there's a line that you cannot cross in this business. You cannot cross this line because if you do cross this line, you cannot come back from there. Tell me about that line that you can't cross. How fine is that line? Very thin. It's the, I, I probably, it's probably the thinnest thing in life, okay? After decades of policing, it seems for Aubin, that line didn't only get thinner, but it began to move. His view of legal and illegal redefined. What was your own police philosophy? I've got, I got a kind of philosophy of the saying like, it could be a little illegal, but not immoral. Put me out of the force if you want. I don't give a damn. Dr. Mike Webster is an internationally renowned hostage negotiator and police psychologist. He's trained crisis intervention teams for the RCMP and the FBI, and been front and center for tense standoffs around the world. From the Branch Davidians hold up in Waco, Texas, to the native protests over land near Gustafson Lake, BC. 
He's heard Oban's kind of moral rationalizing before, and he doesn't buy it. This notion of it being uh, illegal but not immoral, which is ridiculous, uh, it's going to lead in only one direction. He's on the path. Webster says cops like Benoit Reverge, who spend years cozying up to criminal sources, are especially vulnerable to corruption. And he says it can begin with a simple cup of coffee. If I'm a bad guy, you're a policeman, and I've given you this cup of coffee, you've now had to make a moral decision. Do I accept a gift from a bad guy? And when you decide, yeah, I guess I'm the kind of person that can do that, you've opened the door. I've got my foot in the door now. It's just a cup of coffee. It starts with a cup of coffee. These, each one of these steps requires a moral decision. It's a Webster insists there should be no entitlements, no exceptions. But don't you have to bend the rules sometimes to get results? The answer to the question is no, you don't have to. The answer is you can't. And you can't because whether it's taking a free cup of coffee or bending the rules, they're wrong and they're both wrong for the same reason. And that reason is they lead to more grave offenses. There is no gray area. Coming up, how the Hells Angels help put Benoit Robert's behind bars. The police officer has to remember at the end of the day that you're still dealing with a criminal. It's 2009, inside a prison north of Montreal. There was a secret meeting between the gutsy Montreal biker cop Benoit Roberge and the notorious hitman for the Hells Angels, René Charlebois. Though Charlebois is serving a life sentence for the murder of a police informant, Roberge is trying to turn the killer into a snitch. It was a bold gamble that would forever change the lives of the cop and the criminal. If Roberge was playing a dangerous game, getting too close to the Hells Angels, his bosses saw nothing wrong at the time. According to the current Montreal police chief, Marc Parent. On that, you can trust me. I met with a partner that worked for him for five years, and he never saw a sign for five years. And we know that police officers are suspicious. They have this uh, instinct, but in never saw anything. But the warning signs were there, red flags going as far back as the 90s. For example, Robert routinely broke police protocol by meeting sources alone instead of with a partner. Sources like Eric Nadeau, the biker informant who worked with Robert for more than a decade. For the 10 years we met, he was alone um, about 80% about of the time, you know. Uh, we were meeting in parking lots, uh, under bridges. We always met. Um, and, for, and for me not to be followed, I had to always check. I had to really make sure I wasn't being followed. Police are always supposed to have backup when they meet sources. For security, to corroborate any information, and to make sure cash for sources goes to the sources. Former Halifax biker cop Bruce McDonald. You know, there's very uh, stringent rules in, in handling sources that a lot of police forces have. And in a lot of police forces, it's a requirement to have at least two handlers at all times. Um, and though, you know, obviously those rules have developed over the years because of problems that have happened in the past. The police officer have to, has to remember at the end of the day that you're still dealing with a criminal. Richard Dupuis was the head of Montreal's major crimes division and Roberge's boss back in 2004. He said even then the detective was getting too cozy with the bikers, so he put an end to it. One morning, he told me he'd met a very well-known Hells Angel from Montreal. He said they were out on a patio and they shared a really expensive bottle of wine and the biker paid it. It was a three or four hundred dollar bottle. And Ben was totally convinced that he could turn this guy into an informant. 
This was the latest and for Dupuis the last misstep he would tolerate from Roberge, so he kicked him off the anti-biker squad. So tell me about the conversation though. What was his reaction when you told him he was being demoted? I told him you're putting yourself at risk, you're in danger, and you're putting the whole organization in danger. This is not acceptable behavior. You're going to finish your reports and you're never going to do that again. Then he said, you don't know anything. That same year, Montreal police told the informant Nadeau that Roberge was now under investigation. I was strongly advised never to contact Benoit, uh, Benoit Roberge, ever again. I was told nothing. They said it was better for me that way. Roberge was sidelined, but they would soon need him back. He returned to the anti-biker squad for Operation Shark. In 2009, police conducted another sweep of the Hells Angels in Quebec. More than 100 bikers were arrested and paraded before the cameras. And it was all thanks to the testimony of a Hells Angels informant. The outlaw gang was decimated. But Operation Shark wasn't a total success. Somehow, almost 30 angels got away. Dupuis, now a security analyst for the TVA network, says police were convinced a cop was tipping off the bikers. There were leaks going back to 2004. Whenever there was a big operation or raid, if there was a big sweep planned, some people just disappeared or they moved away or else they were right there when we arrived, waiting for us. Benoit Roberge was still working on his sources, still working on René Charlebois behind bars. What they were talking about was still murky, but details would soon come out. The explosive chain of events began September last year, when somehow Charlebois broke out of jail. Twelve days later, police tracked him to this cottage, 100 kilometers from the prison. But by the time they arrived, Charlebois was dead. He left a suicide video and a bombshell. What Roberge didn't know was that Charlebois had been secretly taping their conversations all along. After his suicide, Charlebois left 10 audio recordings that were turned over to the provincial police. According to a source who has listened to them, the tapes reveal that instead of buying information from the Hell's hitman, Roberge was selling him information. Their roles had been reversed. It was Roberge who was the snitch. According to the source, one of the key pieces of information on the table was the whereabouts of an important Hells Angels informant. His testimony was key in the 2009 arrests that decimated the gang. And you'll recall what Charlebois did with snitches. If Robert sold that information, it would not only be a death sentence for the informant, but it would also put his police protectors in the line of fire. In another call, Charlebois tells the cop to leave his car door unlocked so the Hells can drop off an envelope with 100 grand inside. Money Robert says he'll need in case he gets caught. It's so stunning, Quebec Provincial Police wondered, could it be true? So they set up a sting. A double agent, pretending to be an associate of Charlebois, contacted Robert, telling him he had the tapes and was prepared to sell them. A meeting was arranged in this parking lot to seal the deal. And for reasons hard to explain away, Robert showed up. How did the police finally trap Robert? Well, Robert was ready to pay $50,000 to get the tapes that Charlebois made of their conversations. That's how police confirmed what was in those recordings. Because nobody would pay 50000 bucks if they had nothing to hide. Robert was arrested October 5th. He's facing charges of gangsterism, obstruction of justice and breach of trust. 
The charges have not been proven in court. When we come back, from inside his prison cell, Roberge promises he won't go down without a fight. Are you worried that there are going to be other people implicated in this scandal? October 9th last year. The Montreal police held a hastily organized news conference confirming one of their own had been charged with crossing the line. The only consolation that we can see is behind the bars, but... Uh, we... A Blanche chief, Marc Barron, tried to reassure the city his force is not corrupt. I want you to remember that how our police officers are people with uh, good values, honest, and uh, they work with uh, integrity. Speaking to the Fifth Estate months after the arrest, Parent still seems at a loss to explain what happened. Tell me about your reaction when you heard about Roberge. Well, uh, let's say that uh, we, feel, uh, we felt betrayed or uh, deceived about the fact that uh, someone can do that and uh, can go that far. So uh, for all the uh, organization, all the, uh, the members, the uh, employees and the... Uh, officer is very hard because you cannot imagine that something like that can happen. Why not? Well, it's uh, very rare that someone is going to go uh, on the other side, on the uh, dark side. Dr. Mike Webster, the police psychologist, isn't surprised by the chief's reaction. That would be the traditional response by uh, uh, most police services today, that this is just a rotten apple. Right. It's not just a case of a few rotten apples. To say, oh my God, we didn't know this was coming, we are surprised, we're shocked, we're hurt, is ignorant of human nature and of police culture and of the structure of police organizations. So then how are rotten apples made? Are, are they made by their environment? Corrupt police persons are not um, b natural born criminals. Proper corruption control has to look at the barrel as well as the apples, has to look at the organization as well as those who work for it. Corrupt police persons are made, not born. Looking back now, former biker investigator Guy Ouellette, who worked with Robert for years, says his maverick approach to policing made him all the more vulnerable. I was not surprised. I, I was not surprised. My surprise would be that nobody never saw, nobody close to him never saw or never asked. There are some people somewhere who were sleeping. That's my concern. Roberge is being held in solitary confinement for his protection while he awaits trial. But in that letter, obtained by Radio Canada, he said he feels the cards are stacked against him. I feel alone, up against a powerful state. But in spite of all the ups and downs, I'm on the road to recovery. I will be a better person. I had an incredible life with a tragic destiny, but a lot of good memories. This is the price of justice. What an unbelievable situation. Robert wrote that letter to Benoit Perron. The two have been friends for more than 30 years. Perron has spoken with Robert by phone from prison, and he says his old friend is defiant. He said the police were pretty tough with him. They'd like to see me dead, he said. They want to send me to hell, but I'm not going down alone. That's it. Robert had a phone conversation with a friend of his, and in that conversation he told him, if they're going to take me to hell, I'm not going to go down alone. And he repeated that three times. He said, I'm not going to go down alone. Are you worried that there are going to be other people implicated in this scandal? Well, I hope that the investigation will show everything that we need to know. Is this a concern of yours, though? Absolutely, but we do 
uh, are uh, we we are making uh, many variations in that uh, in that sense. We know there's a, a constant uh, shadow of the mob of the organized crime trying to get into the police organization to get information. This pressure is there, so those people working close to the organized crime, uh, we do know that uh, we have to check that it's a near miss for us, so we have to check that very close. As you sit here today, do you realize how big a problem that that is, that nobody on your police force saw this coming? Doesn't that concern you? It's a challenge for all the uh, police organization. Uh, you can work on the uh, early warning, uh, random check. You can put in place, uh, let's say, computer safety system. You can do a lot of things, but you know that the human part of it will be uh, always a challenge for a police organization. If you're going to engage... As allegations continue to swirl, psychologist Dr. Mike Webster says Montreal police should be worrying a whole lot less about their image. The police service is equally to blame as Benoit Robert's. I won't take Benoit Robert's off the hook. However, there's just too much evidence to suggest that Benoit Robert's is the only rotten apple in the barrel. Corruption is corruption. It doesn't change. Human beings are human beings. We need to provide an environment for them where they can be the best that they can be. Bob Stenhouse, the former RCMP undercover cop, says Robert shouldn't be seen as a pariah, but an example of cops who spend too long walking the line. There are gonna be cops that will break the law, and so don't stick our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't happen. Sometimes the system and the organization needs to take some responsibility as well to look for those red flags. The idea of holding police out as something better than in terms of what they might be tempted by is, is dangerous, right? Now, Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, the line between good and evil cuts through every human heart. Shortly before his arrest, Benoit Robert retired from the Montreal Police to work as an investigator with Revenue Quebec, the provincial tax department. We're told in those tapes, he said his new job would give him plenty more valuable information to sell. These tapes will be important evidence at his trial, and we'll keep you up to date as his case slowly winds its way through the courts.